CEO and futurist for Tomorrow Today from South Africa, who tra traversed half the world and 11 time zones uh, to be here with us today. Uh, a big hand for Graham, please. Thank you very much indeed. Kia ora. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you very much uh, to the Iraqi for the uh, welcome. If I can respond to that in a South African uh, greeting from the, the Zulu tribe of South Africa, we would say Saubona, which is not just hello. I think it has an equivalence in Kia ora. It is more than that. It is literally, I see you. Saubona, Iraqi. Uh, it's my privilege to be here, not just as a keynote presenter this morning, but to actually be here for the two days of the conference and be involved in some of the conversations uh, and the dialogue that's going to be happening. And I'm really excited about doing that because as we think about what it takes to be a digital nation, as we think about, uh, Minister has talked about 12 years ago, uh, 12 years from now, as we envisage what that future might look like, we know it's going to come faster than we can imagine. Uh, and we need to put in place things immediately now that are going to set us up for the 2020s and the next decade. So as we begin our thinking uh, for these two days, uh, I think maybe this image sums up what it is that we need to be doing. That we need to be thinking about not only what happens next, but what happens after what comes next? We've all got our strategic priorities in place. We've all got, uh, we know what we should be doing next uh, and what happens now. But I think a two-day session like this, and for, for some of you, a few extra days uh, through the course of this whole week, give us the opportunity to ask what happens after what comes next. And I was asked to just push our minds briefly into that space as uh, we position our thoughts uh, for the next two days. Th there's very little, actually, that I can tell an audience like this. Uh, my task is to work mainly with uh, large multinationals around the world, helping them think about digital transformation. And as I talk to uh, business leaders mainly uh, around the world, uh, most of my work is to just convince them of the urgency of the task of digital transformation. That's unnecessary in this room, I would hope. Uh, I think that's why we're all here. We know this urgency and we want to know which path we need to take. Uh, if we don't do that, uh, we could end up uh, in this sort of situation. Uh, for the visual learners, this might be useful. Because uh, could, could we have these on the side screen as well? Is that possible? Um, these guys are fishermen. They do what they do for a living. You do what you do for a living in the private or public sector. But like these guys, we're not necessarily looking around us for the big unprecedented forces, the things we've never experienced before. In fact, some of you do have colleagues that are half asleep some of the time. By the time we notice these big forces, it can be a bit late. For anyone in financial services, the last thing we want is another bailout, right? So what I thought I'd do to get us going, to get our minds in the right uh, frame this morning, is to take us to one of my favorite places in the world. In fact, there are lots of these favorite places dotted around the planet. I love museums. Uh, this is, in fact, my personal favorite museum. Uh, does anybody know which one it is? This is the British Museum in London. Uh, being a South African, an ex-colony of Britain, it's fantastic to go here because this is where all our stuff is. <laughs> Sorry to the British delegation, that might be a little bit, a little bit close to the bone right there. Um, <laughs> But I, I love museums. In fact, Te Papa down in Wellington is, I think, one of my favorites uh, that I've ever been to. Because in a museum, you find a, a tiny little artifact, maybe a, a bone put in a beautifully encased glass case. And as you look at it, you think, what's this doing here? 
And then you, you do the read up and you see the artist's illustration and you realize we've been able to extrapolate an entire story just from this tiny artifact. That bone maybe being a, a fibia from an ancient dinosaur that gives us some idea of a feathered uh, part of the evolutionary tract. It could be a little piece of ceramic that tells us they had fire and economy and currency. A tiny artifact tells a big story. Uh, of a past. So what about a museum of the future? There is, in fact, such a place. It's being built. In fact, it's nearly done. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is a genuine place in Dubai. If you haven't planned yet to visit the Dubai 2020 uh, World Expo, that would probably be worth putting on your bucket list, by the way. I think it's going to be phenomenal uh, in two years' time. And key to that is the Museum of the Future. Uh, a wonderful place to go and kind of do, I think, what we're going to do a little bit of in the next two days. But I wonder if you would come with me in the next few minutes to a museum of the future, to see just a few artifacts. Each of these artifacts is probably familiar to you, but it tells a larger story. And to make sense of these artifacts, I want to use a, a framework which will hopefully help us. Uh, our team developed this framework a number of years ago, and I think it's really valuable to take some of what we're doing over the next uh, two days and put it into a structured format. We talk about the tides of change, tides being an acronym for the five most disruptive categories of change that we're going to experience over the next few years. I wonder in your head if you can work out what the tides stand for. So let me take you to the first hall in our museum of the future, the T in Tides Technology. It's an obvious place to start. No prizes if you guessed T stood for technology. Uh, it would be strange if it didn't, right? Now, here we could pause in this hall for the whole week. Uh, I mean, there would be a week's worth of stuff to look at in the technology space. So I don't really need to over-elaborate on that, except let me give you one example, one artifact. I still think that the most significant artifact in the hall of technology is the mobile phone. In fact, it's not a phone, is it? It's a, it's a mobile supercomputer in the palms of our hands. The uh, minister was, uh, actually stole a little bit of my thunder. I was about to tell you that you know, this was June of 20, 2007. So it's literally just over 10 years ago that we first got a smartphone. Some of you are looking at me a little bit strangely. You're thinking back and thinking, I'm sure I had a smartphone before the iPhone. Uh, you're thinking of a BlackBerry. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was no smartphone. Let's not kid ourselves, right? Okay? Proper smartphones, 10 and a half years old. What most of you had 12 years ago, as the minister was uh, referencing, was a Nokia 3210, right? Okay, and that, by the way, would still be a magnificent phone because even today, 11 years later, it would still have battery life. <laughs> and, and those of you with your iPhones are going to be looking for a charging point by lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. Samsung people don't laugh at the iPhones, okay? If you've got a Samsung, you've also got battery problems. Your problem is just the fire extinguishers being there, <laughs> there. Okay. <laughs> These supercomputers, because that's what they are, are the only things in our lives that are less than an arm's length away at all times now. There is nothing else that is closer to you than your smart device. Most of you have one there right on the table in front of you. I'm looking at the front table, four out of four. Uh, what do we got there? Five out of six. Uh, most of you, this is the first thing you saw this morning, okay? Beep, 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 and off you go. First thing that you got going. Some of you, once you had it in your hands, wouldn't put it down for anything. You took this to the toilet with you this morning. Don't raise your hands, but I can see. Which is why, by the way, you should never use anybody else's phone these days. <laughs> if you had left it at home or back in the hotel, you would have gone back for it, right? That's why some of you were late this morning. Suddenly realized, oh, no. Uh, you can leave your wallet at home these days because, well, everything's in here. And for some of you, this will be the last thing you see tonight. 
even if there's a partner in the bed next to you. It's a good night on this side, and then... Good night on that side as well. Now, I realize that's a little bit of an exaggeration, although possibly with this audience, I've underestimated the usage. Who knows? Uh, it's great to be at a conference where they tell you not to switch your phone off. I do like that. But we've got to go beyond just the sort of hype of having a supercomputer in our pocket. What does this exhibit mean for us? Well, I think that one of the most urgent requirements that we have, whether it's a government or a private company or individuals, is to put mobile first. I realize that's Microsoft's internal slogan, so I'm stealing a little bit uh, from a single company. But m mobile first is an absolute priority. Not creating a website that works and then hoping that the mobile version kind of gets by. Not creating a system that's reasonably user-friendly. Creating something that allows an individual with literally one hand and three clicks of their thumb to do anything. When I check into my flight to fly back to Johannesburg on Tuesday evening, it's going to take me three clicks. Get into the airline app, select my booking, confirm my seat, get my boarding pass. Three clicks. To get in and out of passport control or to, to get onto the plane itself, three clicks. To do a bank transfer, three clicks. To verify identity, to update a status, to let my family know I'm on my way home, to upload pictures of my visit while I'm here, to record notes, three clicks. So in your organization, is it three clicks? Staff members want to book their leave. Do you have an internal staff app and is it three clicks? Somebody wants to get information about something from you. Is it three clicks? From a government perspective, if I'm wanting to update information, do a, the, the annual registration of my motor vehicle or update the rates of my house, is it three clicks? Is it one hand, one thumb, three clicks? Mobile first. That's the simplicity. I realize there's complexity to make that happen, but that's the simplicity of the outcome. That's what this exhibit in my Museum of the Future asks of us. So technology. As I say, literally I could spend all of my time in this hall, but let's move on because the I in the tides of change moves us into another hall, and that is institutional change. Now, institutions are the systems, the structures, the processes and procedures of our world. This is the, the government space and the, the, the policies and systems. But it's also the spaces in our organizations, how we go about doing things. And we live in a world of immense structural change. In fact, I think this is one of the defining features of the age that we live at a moment where there is deep structural change in all of the systems of society, from politics to religion, from economics to civil society. So what to choose is my exhibit here. This was a tough one, actually. I had a whole list, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to show you five things very, very quickly. But I think blockchain deserves to be top of the list. Unfortunately, at the moment, the blockchain, which is, of course, more a distributed ledger system about how we actually measure and record our transactions, it's been taken over by Bitcoin and all the hype and craziness of Bitcoin. And I think, actually, sadly, Bitcoin's destroyed a little bit of the conversation we should be having at the moment because we're all just wanting to know, did you buy Bitcoin at the right price and did you sell it at the right price? And, you know, what's the price this very moment? Uh, and we can have that conversation at, at, at some stage. I'm, I'm a skeptic about the value of that as an investment vehicle. But I'm not skeptical at all about the value of the underlying technology, the blockchain itself. This is where openness and transparency is going to come from. This is where actually security 
uh, and integrity of transactions is going to come from in the future, with everything from recording share transactions uh, to marriages. Uh, there are, I think, already three marriages registered in the blockchain. Uh, because why not? It's any transaction uh, that needs to be registered and, and recorded. So cybersecurity, as the minister was already saying, is absolutely essential. But blockchain also unlocks something else for us. And as I say, this is a little bit of a cheat because I'm showing you about five or six exhibits here all at once. But obviously, the impact of artificial intelligence, I think more importantly than artificial intelligence, is machine learning, uh, is actually going to be accelerated if we put it on the platform of blockchain. Uh, in other words, distribute this power uh, that we're developing in, in fundamental ways and start with it as an open distributed system uh, rather than closed silos uh, of machine learning in, in dif housed in different companies in different countries. So, from an institutional perspective, there's going to be a lot for us to talk about over the next two days as we think about what do all of the things that we talk about from a technology perspective, how do they impact the institutions of society. The third hall brings in probably the most important piece of the puzzle, and that is the people, the demographics. So T for technology, I for institutional change, D in our museum of the future for the demographics, the people, where people live, how people live, how they engage and connect with each other. And here my exhibit was an easy choice. Probably the most significant demographic trend in the world right now is longevity. Each one of us is going to live longer than we thought we would. Now, here's a change of pace in my museum of the future because this is not a technology issue anymore. This is about people. You are going to live longer than you thought you would. And this is going to have a massive impact on how the world looks uh, over the next 10, 20, 30, even 50 years. Here's some interesting statistics for you. In countries all around the world, and especially in all the countries represented in this room, the number of people turning 100 is increasing at unprecedented rates. Number of people having their 100th birthdays <laughs> is, <laughs> well, there are about a 1,000 people a day turning 100 all around the world at the moment. And in, if, in any country, in every country that, that measures the 100-plus age group, uh, this number is increasing dramatically. I have a 104-year-old grandmother. She turned 104 last Wednesday. She was born, just to get what 104 looks like, she was born before the start of World War I and is still alive today and can tell her stories and can reflect on the past century. I have three daughters, three teenage daughters. <laughs> That's why I travel so much. Um, my oldest daughter, Amy, was born in 1999, and she is going to live in three centuries. She's got the genetics to do it, and if she dies younger than 80, we're going to say she died young. But she's likely to live to at least 101, and having been born in the last century, will die in the next one and live through this whole century. You have got people in your homes. You have got people in your businesses who are going to live in three centuries. And that must change how we think about our world and how we engage with our world. Now, there is a technology piece to this, of course. We are living longer because of remarkable advances in technology right now. Probably the most significant one, and maybe this is the specific thing that should sit in my museum of the future, is CRISPR. I'm sure you've all heard of CRISPR. I won't ask you to raise your hands and embarrass yourself if you haven't yet. CRISPR, maybe I should ask how many of you know what CRISPR stands for? Uh, clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats of the DNA and RNA sequence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there will be a test later. I hope you were concentrating. But CRISPR is basically a technology that allows us to go into the genetic code of each of the cells of our body and actually change the genetic code. It, it, it's, that's a very simplistic view of it. What it actually does 
is it goes in and cuts out broken parts of your DNA. And we've recently discovered that our DNA has a backup system in it and can restore DNA if the CRISPR protein extracts broken parts of it. We can fix DNA problems. And we now have the potential, the promise in the next five to 10 years is our ability to do that in human beings, to do that in adult human beings. Remove genetic diseases, remove cancers and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but also remove aging from the system. You see, when I said you might live to 100, some of you didn't like that thought because being older longer doesn't sound like fun. I don't think it is. But the promise of this artifact in my museum is that you will be younger longer. That's a whole lot cleverer. Now, what does this mean? What does an artifact like living to 100 mean? Well, it probably means that you can't retire at age 62. You can't retire at 62 and then live to 100 and expect the system to survive. You can't put 40 years into a retirement fund and take 42 or 43 years out of it and not break it. It's not magic, it's just maths. So we've got to change some things. One of the favorite things that our company works with is we work with call centers uh, around the world. It's a little thing that we do, but it's the most fun thing that we do. Because if you have a call center or know a call center, you'll know that call centers have massively high staff turnover. Lots of people coming and going all the time. And the reason for that is actually very, very simple. You've got the wrong people in your call center. If you think about a call center, the job of a call center operative, sit on their backside all day, answering the phone, helping solve somebody else's problem, and in between those phone calls, sit and have tea with your friends. Does that sound like your 20-year-old child or your 65-year-old mother? Genuine question. Is this your child or is this your mother? I don't want it to be sex, it could be your father as well. Is this your child or your parent? This is your parent. I told you, I've got three teenage daughters, and their ability to actually speak on the phone on a scale of one to ten is about minus three. Hmm? Huh? Yeah. Hmm? Hmm? Huh. Hmm? Their desire to actually help other people solve their problems. <laughs> Why do we put 20-something young people into our call center and then freak out when they decide to leave after eight months. Why don't we put 60, 70 year olds into our call centers and you know what happens when you do? Everything goes brilliantly. Customer satisfaction goes through the roof. Staff satisfaction is at an all high. The only thing that goes wrong is the average length of phone call gets a little bit out of hand. <laughs> but other than that, it's brilliant. We're going to live longer than we thought we would, and that's going to change everything. Technology is part of making that happen, and technology is part of how we deal with it. And we need some institutional changes along the way as well. So let's move on to the fourth hall of this museum of the future. This is about the environment, about natural resources, about how we look after the planet. And of course, here yeah, there are many, many different exhibits. Many of them are quite scary exhibits, telling us of the damage that we're doing and the difficulties that our planet has creaking as it is at the moment under the strain of how we live our lives. But I thought I'd give you some good news. So my exhibit in the environmental hall is around energy. You see, I believe we're on the edge of a new era. If we were to accept it, if our governments were to embrace it, I think we are very, very close to living in an era of abundant, which means also cheap, clean energy. And for me, it's not just so much about it being clean. That's important. We, we get that. It's also about it being cheap and accessible. Uh, there are a number of reasons I'm, I'm really upbeat about this. One of these is a place in the world called Itter. Uh, let me do ask this one. How many of you have heard of ITER? Okay. 
the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor being built in the south of France near Marseille. There were a few hands going up, but generally this audience has not raised their hands. This is an audience that I would have expected to know a little bit about this. ITER is a massive underground magnetically covered vacuum chamber into which you pump a plasma of deuterium and, tri and tritium, you superheat it using 50 megawatts of electricity, and then a nuclear fusion reaction takes place. This is the good type of nuclear that only has heat as its output and byproduct. And you can turn 500 megawatts of heat, which is the output, into thermal energy and electricity. Basically, in simple terms, this is a star. That is exactly what happens in the center of the sun every day. We now know how it works and we're building one. Isn't that remarkable? We are building a star on planet Earth. If you haven't heard of this, go to ITER.org. Uh, these are some photographs from a site visit I did a, a number of months ago. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable place. If it works, man, it's likely to work. We will build one on every continent. We can bring free energy, essentially. I know there's a lot of cost involved to build the thing, but once you've built the thing, there's free energy because deuterium and tritium, does anybody know where you get deuterium and tritium? I'm guessing our hosts are saying, please, please, Auckland, please. <laughs> um, it's actually in seawater. We are building a star on planet Earth that is fueled by seawater and turn seawater into free electricity. Isn't that remarkable? It'll come on stream in 2027. Between now and then, we can rely on solar and the sun. Solar is going crazy. The price of solar panels has halved in the last eight months. The efficiency of solar panels has doubled since January last year. And solar is, is really becoming viable because batteries are going crazy as well, mainly driven by this guy, Elon Musk, uh, in his quest to make a really great sports car, which is now orbiting Mars. Um, he has built magnificent batteries. There's also one other thing that you should know about. Has anyone heard of the Breakthrough Energy Coalition? Again, very few hands. If you haven't, BreakthroughEnergyCoalition.com. Not the world's shortest website address, but there it is. BreakthroughEnergyCoalition.com. Started by someone I'm sure you have heard of, Bill Gates. And he founded this two years ago. He put $4 billion of his own money into this fund to get it started. You do sort of have to pause a little bit when you talk about $4 billion of your own money. <laughs> uh, then he went to 27 of his closest friends, none of whom apparently are poor, um, and they matched him. And now he's going to the governments of the world and asking them to match them again. They want $15 billion in this fund, and they'll have it probably by the middle of this year. It's not bad for two and a half years worth of fundraising. And they want to invest in breakthrough or miracle energy ideas. Things that will bring us, and this is their specific and deliberate goal, that will bring us free energy. That's their goal. Imagine what we could do to our planet if we could bring cheap and clean energy to the world. It would change everything. And it's actually, I think, likely to happen. You with me so far? Technology, institutional change, demographics, the environment, and as we close out now very quickly, social values. You see, we've, let me pull this all together with just actually an example of what I mean here. Let's take the example of driverless cars, okay? We know these are coming, right? This is not an if now it is a when. We, we know they're coming, and, and very soon we won't just have uh, legal driverless cars. I think there will be many places in the world where driverless cars will become compulsory. We'll get the value of driverless cars when every car is required to be driverless. And I think that that may very well happen in a few cities and a few small countries around the world, maybe some of your countries, 
by 2030 uh, in various parts uh, of the world. And what's the real value here? Let's use this tides model very quickly to help us think about it. We know the technology exists of driverless cars. Institutional change is about whether governments will actually give licenses. Uh, and, and, and whether there's a license to drive for driverless cars. The demographics is how it will impact people. My 104-year-old grandmother had her license taken away 10 years ago. She went to renew her license in the UK, um, and they told her she shouldn't be driving anymore. <laughs> they were right. Um, but she argued with the instructor and said, Sonny, I was driving before you were born. And he said, yes, ma'am, that's the problem. Um, and, and so now, for the last 10 years, she hasn't been able to be mobile, but she could be. My youngest daughter, who has autism and will never be able to function independently, by the time she gets to a point in life where it might be valuable for her to be independent, I'm dreaming of that day that she will be able to use driverless cars. So it's pe old people and people with disabilities and young people and families will all be impacted. Demographics. The environment, these driverless cars are very likely to be electric, of course. But social values is important too because I am, and we've got a multinational group here, and I'm not sure quite of body language, but I do sense a few people, maybe these are the Germans in the room, who are going, hmm, you can come and get my steering wheel out of my cold, dead hands, son. <laughs> How many of you love driving? Love, uh, not in traffic, but you love your cars. You guys are going to be like horse owners are. A <laughs> hundred years ago, we would have all had a horse, working animal, there'd be a stable out the back of Cordis here, and we'd all have our horses there, and that's how we would get home this evening. Today, if you own a horse, you've got somebody who looks after it on a farm somewhere outside the city. You pay them a lot of money to do that. You go and visit your horse every weekend, and you ride it for an hour. You take a photograph of it, and then you show all your friends at work every morning, oh, look at my horse, and you've even got a name for it and everything. That's going to be your car in 15 years' time. We're going to have a network of compulsory autonomous and, I think, shared cars. If you were me, what would you have put in your museum? This is an impossible task the organizers gave me in my 30 minutes. But I hope that this model, this framework of tides provides a framework for us as we have our conversations these next two days to think about all of the various aspects of the, of the issues that we will talk about and discuss. Yes, the technology is there. That's the thing that gets us in the room. It's the shiny stuff that all the nerds are really excited about. But then, of course, there's the institutional issues. And we've got a lot of government in the room to help us to think through that and the policies and the implications of that. And then there's the people and the demographics. Let's never forget them. And the environment must come into it. And finally, it's social values. How does this impact our lives? What do we value? How do we make life better? And so maybe for me, that's my challenge as we start our conversations and our journey today. How can we talk about the future? How can we as people who live in the future, who want digital nations in 2030, how can we do what we do in such a way that other people want to go there with us? Let's not run ahead of our constituencies. Let's not just be attracted by the shiny technologies, but let's build digital nations 2030 with the emphasis on the nation building of the future. Thank you very much. That's fabulous. Thanks, right. um, thank you very much indeed, Graham. Um, we've got time for questions, so please do be putting questions through um, on your conference app, because I'm seeing them come through here, which should be very helpful. Thank you. Um, if I might just jump in um, with a, uh, one question for starters. In our own minds, we can sort of plot technology change. How are you plotting society's ability to deal with change um, against that technology change? Gee, fascinating question. Um, I think history, so the task of a futurist, if, if you 
grab one of my business cards from me during the next two days, you'll see the title Futurist on it, um, which is fascinating when you go through passport control, by the way, and they <laughs> ask you what is typically ask you to predict a sports score for the next day's uh, game. Um, but that's not our job as a futurist. The futurist's task is to actually look at the past. And, and so in answering your question, when we look at the past, we, we have conflicting data. We have examples of technologies that were introduced that took forever to be accepted, that people pushed back against and they, they, didn't, they didn't want that technology. And then we have other examples where it moved very, very quickly. So a good example of that, maybe a strange one, but when we decided finally that smoking was bad for you and we kicked the smokers out, Sorry, smokers, uh, you know, first break, you're going to have to walk outside. I think it's raining even. You know this, rain, wind, hail, snow, get out of our buildings. That happened very, very quickly. Same happened, for example, with uh, uh, the seatbelts in cars. When society is ready for a change, you can make that change very, very quickly. And so part of our task, and I think part of our task in this room, is to work out how do we show society the value of what we're trying to do. Um, and, and if they catch the value, we can move exceptionally quickly. Um, where society is pushing back at change, we need to realize we haven't sold the value. So I don't think it's got anything to do with the technology itself, or the rules, or the systems, or even government regulation. I think it's got to do with that last little piece, societal values. Do people know the value? Can they sense the value of what we're offering? Mm, thank you. And um, with all the organizations that you work with um, that um, are the most adept and the most enthusiastic about change, uh, whether they be individuals or organizations, um, are there some uh, characteristics that hmm. are, are the real hallmarks of those people and organizations that just embrace change so well? I think the most important characteristic, and, and, and possibly this might be the most important thing I say today, so thanks for the question. I think it's a culture of experimentation. I think if, if you and I were to choose a list of the top 10 innovative companies in the world, we'd probably have very similar lists. And I think if you look at those organizations, I think you will discover without exception, every single one of them will have found a way to build in a culture of experimentation. Now, there's a lot that goes under that. That's uh, not scared of failing. Um, that's longer-term thinking rather than short-term thinking. If, uh, if those are publicly listed companies, they have found a way to basically say to their shareholders, shut up, we don't care. Uh, I mean, Amazon is the best at that. Just, uh, just say to their shareholders, really, we don't care what you think. Um, uh, and uh, not all of them can be that bold. Um, you know, it does help that the owner found is still in charge. Um, but I think a culture of experimentation where curiosity, uh, no fear of failure, um, and a longer-term thinking uh, are embedded in the organization, I think that's helpful. From a government perspective, it means somehow we've, we've got to find a way to make sure we're not just thinking about the next election um, and think beyond that, which means, bizarrely, that some of the countries that are moving fastest are the least democratic countries. Um, <laughs> which is an interesting thought. Uh, there is an alternative to a non-democratic approach. Yes, of course. <laughs> which is where there is um, very strong um, societal cohesion on yes. an issue. And, and, and therefore, bilateral support a change of like government that. doesn't become a, a change of yeah. plan. Yeah. It becomes a, a decision about who's going to yeah. best deliver. And, I mean, is that a, is yes, that a helpful no, and, and your best example is, uh, I, I lived in London for five years, a, a, a British background. The best example there is the NHS in, in the UK, mm. where there's bilateral support for from both major parties that this is a good thing. And so it's not something they fight over. Mm -hmm. uh, they might fight over small detail, but you don't fight over the bigger issue. Um, and and I, uh, Rosalie introducing uh, earlier, saying that you know here in New Zealand, having a unified vision of what New Zealand might be by 2030 is vital. Unified also means trying to unify the political parties to make sure that all the political parties buy into that vision so it's not something you compete with each other at every election. 
Um, and that's, I think, putting the country uh, and the people first rather than your political party first. But I'm not a politician, so I'm probably out of line with some of what I've been saying. Um, unity, yes. But how, in that culture of unity, do we also um, have a very strong um, culture of, of challenge and of new ideas and of resetting and of, of constantly iterating? Um, so we just don't say, well, here's the unity, go away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for me, that uh, the you know, previous answer repeated again. I think that culture of experimentation um, is key. Uh, so very simple things that you can do. A number of the clients that I work with have awards at the end of every year, and they've got the standard awards, the best innovation and you know, best manager and best salesperson. But they've also added the best experiment. And by best experiment, they mean something that we tried during the year that didn't work, but we learned a lot from. And, and that's, that, for me, is the key. There's a mindset of saying, as long as we're learning from these things, at one level, it doesn't really matter whether they worked or not. It's not a business project that we did. You don't want projects to fail. But it's an experiment. We tried something, and we tried it simply, merely, almost, for the sake of what we could learn from it. Mm. Um, so a really good example there is many companies still struggle with this flexible working hours thing. I don't understand this, and I work for a small little uh, consultancy myself, and you know, we're completely and utterly virtual and flexible um, in everything from our day-to-day -day hours to our annual leave. We just judge people on outcomes. So it kind of, it's a really difficult mindset for me to walk into an organization that still wants to tell adults when to arrive and when to leave on a certain day. But most companies still have this issue. For me, that is the simplest experiment that you could try. You're actually not going to break anything by saying, for the next month, we're going to take these three teams and we're going to give them flexibility in their hours. We're going to have a look at what happens. And at the end of the month, we're going to come back and analyze, was it good or was it bad? It costs you nothing. It's not going to break anything. Uh, but you look at the fear in managers' eyes when you ask them to do that because they think that in 2018, they've still got command and control as long as everybody's in the room. Um, so it can be just as simple as that, uh, yeah. that you try something that simple and see what happens. Um, here's a great question from one of our homegrown futurists. Uh, Stephanie asks, uh, Graham, you talk about some of the drivers that are relatively certain. Uh, what are the greatest uncertainties you see, and mm -hmm. what opportunities do you think they give rise to? Sure. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a really well-made point. Uh, part of the strategy I take when I speak to organizations is I deliberately choose things, sort of my museum of the future concept, I deliberately choose exhibits that are familiar to people. Because the last thing I want is for people sitting in an audience to say, that'll never happen. Um, you know, the colony on Mars kind of thing. I can throw out the example, I believe in it, I think it'll happen, I'd sign up, by the way. Um, but it's easy for people in the audience to say that won't happen. So I tend to, to pick things that are much closer uh, to reality and things where everybody in the room is going, yep, that is going to happen. I'm sure that will happen. The danger is that they kind of think I haven't pushed them far enough. So this, uh, was it Sarah, did you oh, say? Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, you asked the question. Thanks. So that gave me a little bit of an opportunity. I think human augmentation. Is, is huge, and, uh, and I would really expect to see something around that's the next step. Before the robots take over our jobs, the robots are going to help us be better human beings, and we're going to you know, put stuff into our bodies, and, and I think that'll be interesting. Um, I think the potential for pandemics, uh, you know, if I think back to World War I, when, when my grandmother was, was born, more people died of the flu in, in the winter after World War I than had died in World War I. And flu is still something that is dangerous and getting more and more dangerous. <laughs> For the Kiwis in the room, it was Aussie flu last year that killed us, okay? It's typical, okay? Uh, dangerous Aussies. Um, but I think that, that diseases catching up with us and our medicines not being able to handle them could, could be a real issue. Uh, and I personally think we're more likely to have flying cars before driverless cars uh, around our cities, which will make transportation 
uh, fascinating. And then add in things like Hyperloop and so on. So those were the sort of the three top things that jumped to mind. Human augmentation, diseases, and transportation, and a colony on Mars. Thank you. And on a personal note, uh, please do come to my 100th birthday celebration, which will be 2050. And yours will be when? 2070. And I, I oh. plan for that to be about seven-eighths of the way through. I'll, I'll work on it. There we go. See so if you can come to mine. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 120? Yeah. Oh, I wasn't planning on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a very big hand for Graham, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 Thank you very much.